Hello everyone and welcome to the third day of the Summer School on Optimization and Control Infrastructure Networks. My name is Ognian and I'll be hosting sessions related to the power systems topics today. Uh, we have a very packed schedule uh, for today. We have two speakers in the morning, uh, then a lunch break, and then two speakers in the afternoon. So we'll be finishing around um, 7 p.m. Our first speaker, who I'll briefly introduce now, is Professor Henrik Sandberg from KTH. Professor Sandberg received his master's degree in engineering physics in 1999 from Lund University and the PhD degree in automatic control in 2004 from the same university. From 2005 to 2007, he was a postdoctoral scholar at Caltech in the USA. Then in 2013, he was a visiting scholar at the Laboratory for Information and Decision Systems at MIT. Uh, he has also held visiting appointments at the Australian National University and the University of Melbourne. He's currently professor at the Division of Decision and Control Systems at KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. His current research interests include security of cyber physical systems, R systems, model reduction, and fundamental limitations in control. Dr. Sandberg was a recipient of numerous awards, and some of them are the best student paper award from the CDC in 2004, and Ingvar Carlsson Award from the Swedish Foundation for Strategic Research in 2007, and a consolidator grant from the Swedish Research Council in 2016. He has also served on the editorial boards of the IEEE Transactions on Automatic Control and the IFAC Journal Automatica. Professor Sandberg, thank you for uh, coming. It is our pleasure and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Magnin, for the, this uh, kind uh, invitation, opportunity to speak here today. And yeah, thank you to all the organizers at EPFL and ETH for organizing. I, I wish I was, in, was able to go to Lausanne, uh, maybe next year, let's, <laughs> let's hope. Uh, let's see, I would like to share my slides. Uh, where are they? There. So, can you see them now? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Good. See if I can. So, I was able to see the chat as well. Uh, yes. So, um, I'm here today to talk about some uh, power systems topics, and uh, I chose the title Optimal Scheduling Power System Applications. Uh, when I worked on the slides, I realized that I'm, I'm mostly going to focus on one particular uh, application on, on uh, scheduling and discrete uh, combinatorial optimization in, in the power systems, but I think there are many many such problems. I will list some of those. Uh, and I will also try to cover some of the some of the background material that um, I think is necessary to uh, to understand uh, what I'm talking about here today. With that said, I, I really hope that you uh, interrupt me, send a chat message or just interrupt me if you have any questions. Uh, I was hoping I plan for around two times 45 minutes. So I will try to speak for 45 minutes, have a break. And uh, of course you can also ask questions in the break if, if that is, uh, if you'd like to do that. Uh, and with that, uh, I think I will, will start. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that the slides I've been using here, it's uh, contributions from many people in, um, in our group, former, uh, formerly in our group, or other, other collaborators, for instance, King Chong Zhu, Philip Andrean, Michel, Michel Chong, Martin Lindstrom, David Imsons, Tom Pesa Sahara, and Carl Henrik Johansson. So they have all contributed over the years to this material. Um, so the topic uh, I would like to talk about today is, of course, uh, let's see here, I minimize the, this so it doesn't. Power grids, uh, and uh, I think here is, is a schematic view of a, of a power grid. Uh, I think this is just to show the, the different scales and the sizes of, of these systems. So it ranges from all the way from the transmission level, where we have the major 
bulk generation, such as uh, hydro plant. I suppose you have lots of those in, in Switzerland, in Sweden as well, where we have a very high voltage, all the way down through different layers to the to the household where we uh, usually have around 230 volts in, 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 uh, in Sweden and in uh, Switzerland, I suppose. Uh, so this is a, certainly a large scale network systems. Uh, today, I will mostly focus on this lowest layer. Uh, I think during the day, you will see uh, examples also of, uh, of some lectures touching upon the other layers. But I, I, I will focus on, on, on this layer here and I will motivate that as we get along. Uh, just to have a, a picture, the lowest layer, this is how it can look like, uh, at least in Sweden. Uh, this is one, this secondary substation taking down the voltage from the medium voltage to the low voltage. And it feeds into uh, a small uh, uh, st uh, station that feeds the houses here. So this is kind of the, the level we're talking about today. So the substation, here's a typical uh, a line diagram of how it looks like. The substation is this station here, and there's a line that feeds the different houses here. And if it's a smart uh, system, smart power grid, often you think about that the houses may have their own generation, so there might be solar panels, etc. That's what's indicated here with DCAC, so a solar panel, so a DC device. So it, it could potentially uh, convert to AC and feed it back into the grid. That would be a, an example of a components you, you would see in a, in a smart power grid. So today I will talk about AC grids. So uh, we will talk about active and reactive power flows. So it's all AC systems today. This is just an example of, of the systems we're talking about. Uh, so the outline of the talk is something like this. I will first give a little bit of background on a particular problem uh, we'll talk about, the scheduling problem I mentioned. Um, and then I will move into some of the basics. How do we model these systems uh, on the uh, distribution level? Uh, I think you have a little bit of a mixed background between uh, power grids and traffic networks optimization. So uh, feel free here to say, tell me to speed up or slow down depending on what you what you think. And then I will move on into the particular application I mentioned, namely minimum time secure rollout. So it's a scheduling problem of how to optimally uh, schedule and uh, uh, yeah, put out applications on, on a smart power grid on these uh, distributed devices in a, in, a, in a power grid. So we will touch upon things like integrated linear programming, bin packing, and some case studies just to see how this works in, in practice. So that's, that's the outline I had in mind. So as I mentioned already, I, I planned for around two times 45 minutes. So hopefully we will get to around maybe the power distribution, a little bit into the scheduling application in the first 45 minutes. We'll see how far we get. All right. So if there's no questions so far, I think we'll just move on. Uh, yes, I should say that this problem I, uh, I'm talking about today, scheduling problem, it, it derives from a European project we've been involved in. It's, it's ended last year. It's called the Largo project, and it has lots of uh, partners, especially in Austria and in Germany, AIT, Siemens, and Wiener Netze. It was uh, mainly, it was hosted in Vienna. Uh, so th this is kind of where, where some of these, uh, this problem actually comes from. That's how I got uh, interested in this problem, in this project. And the main sort of uh, background for this project is something like this. So here's again uh, a diagram trying to illustrate the, uh, this is now the medium voltage uh, uh, power grid. And here you indicate the, uh, secondary substations taking down the, the voltage now from the medium voltage to the low voltage. So the households you have down here. So this is typically how, how it looks today. You see it, there's this very particular radial network on the lowest level. And we will have to see lots of radial networks today. And 
<clears throat> if you think about the control now uh, in this network, typically uh, you have some sort of substation controller, at least in the, this is the primary substation. The controllers here typically can regulate the voltage, the tap, tap changing in the transformers. And there might also be some controllers in the, in the, in the secondary substations here. Uh, <clears throat> in the households, as I mentioned, if there are solar panels, there might be what we call a building energy management system. So uh, like a local uh, optimization system trying to optimize the, uh, the generation of, of power and, and also the consumption. There might be demand response schemes. Uh, typically, th these are very decentralized systems today. There are not much of communications between these, these systems. Although we could imagine that it could be beneficial to have a communication link between the secondary substation control and the energy management systems and also by the primary substation. So this dashed line here indicate the communication link. Uh, but that's maybe not so common today, but I think that's where we're going. This is what the smart grid is all about. Uh, what maybe we would like to see in the future, this diagram here tries to indicate the level of automation in, in these lowest level power grids. And as time goes up, we may be here somewhere now. So we perhaps we see occasional communications here. But what, where we would like to go is, I think, some, something like this, where all of these energy management systems in your houses, kind of optimizing your charging of your car and, uh, and um, the generation of your, your um, of, of <coughs> solar power and battery management, et cetera. That is being sort of communicating with, 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 with the main grid, trying to optimize, for instance, the level of utilization of green power or minimizing price, et cetera. So th this is kind of where we, where we would like to, to go, but we're not quite there yet. So that, that's, I think, a picture. So here are some of the challenges involved in this uh, transition. Uh, so first of all, there now, there will be some sort of coupling between so the dashed lines or communication networks and the full solid lines or the power grid. So there will be some sort of inter interaction between the ICT and the power grid. This is a typical example of what we call a cyber physical system. And one challenge here, another one, is that this ICT network now is going to be used both for the runtime of operation of this. So as I mentioned, like how do we communicate, for instance, price information and availability of power between these substation controllers uh, and the energy management systems. That, that communication is done on this ICT network. But there's also a lot of maintenance that should go on on the same network, like updates of software. There's going to be uh, quite complicated uh, software being deployed and running over these devices. So how do we maintain these? How do we update uh, parameters? There might be bugs, of course, there will be bugs. There's always bugs. There also be, might be new security threats. So this maintenance is also going on on the same network. And this project I was talking about, the larger project we talked, we discussed a, a lot about this. How, do we, how should we do this application maintenance in these, in these groups? And especially then what, given all this coupling between the, the IT, ICT network and the power grid, what, what can be the effects on the, on the power grid? So for instance, uh, voltage levels, can we ensure voltage levels under failure, software failures in these devices, or if there's a security threat? So those are kind of the, the high level problem formulation challenges we've been thinking about. Um, just to come back to, so one of my main research interests in have been security threats in, in uh, cyber physical systems. And just to mention that we, we are facing quite severe uh, security threats in these. So it's not uh, just, uh, uh, it's really true that there are quite advanced attacks. And here's just some uh, news article from 2015 from Ukraine, but there was special malware called Black Energy that was used there to, to take out an entire distribution grid. So a lot of customers here, it's, I think it says 80,000 customers. So basically this power grid, let's go back here to see the picture. Uh, 
So by an IT attack, basically, we were they were able to take out this layer here from from, uh, from the power grid. So that that happened actually. Um, so there are special malware that that is able to do that today. So we need to take that into account when we develop these application uh, applications for the smart grid. That there are such uh, threats around. And here is another one. Uh, from the US, uh, this is an article from New York Times saying that hacking the, the Russian power grid that the US has also infiltrated the Russian side. Here in Ukraine, I think the accusation has been that it was Russia. So this is just reflecting, I think, there are many, <clears throat> many state actors that are interested in looking into this. So that is some of, 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 of the motivation for, for, for this work. Okay, um, that was kind of the the, uh, the background for uh, for this this work. So let's now <clears throat> move into the sort of the modeling part. Let's get into the, some of the more technical details of what we're actually doing. Um, so here is uh, a very simplified. Diagram of the uh, chat window here, so I don't lock myself. So, uh, so here is a simple uh, line diagram of uh, basically a small section. Um, as I already mentioned, on, on the this distribution level, we will often have these radial grids, so no mesh mesh networks. So why is that? One, one reason is actually uh, safety for the customers. Uh, so basically saying that if there's a, it's a, it's a circuit breaker somewhere, if there's a fault or something, then if you cut, cut the line, all the customers below are sort of loses the voltage. And that's a safety issue because they, 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 nobody will be electrocuted. Um, if there would be a mesh, there is always a risk that somebody would feed power from the other side. So if there's a fault somewhere in the system, then there's a more complicated uh, safety controls is necessary. You need coordination to make sure that there's actually no feeding from any side that, that could electrocute the customer. So often in many, in many countries, it's actually said that it has to be a, like, you can only feed from, from one side. With that said, often there's configurations so you can reconfigure the system so that the feeding comes from different sides, but simultaneously there should only be feeding from one, one, one point. And all the safety, the automatic safety functionality is, 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 uh, is configured that way that it should come from, from, from one side. Uh, actually, that is another issue that a lot of the safety functions in these grids are configured so that power should only go one direction from the from the top, so to say, from the secondary substation out to the customers. So that is another challenge now that if the customer starts to uh, put solar panels on their on their houses and suddenly start to on a sunny day and the power goes the other way, uh, is this is the safety system in, in the automatic safety system in the grid actually configured for that? Uh, because suddenly the powers are going the other direction and you, you don't want a power outage just because of this. So there are many actually issues here. Uh, many of these systems are quite old, I should also say, and the, the level of coordination is not that high. Anyways, uh, here is uh, the grid. Uh, a bus here, we can think about as a household, more or less, or a sub uh, connection point in the grid. Uh, we, on every line here, we assume that there is an impedance, a line impedance with some resistance uh, and reactance. Reactance is, yeah, in, inductance typically, there's some inductive load on the line. Uh, we don't have any shunt elements on the lines here. Those have to be included in, in the injection points here. Uh, so the models I use here today, they will assume that there's only a line resistance like this. Uh, the variables I will use today, uh, so V, uh, VK, it's the voltage level at bus K. 
it's actually the, the magnitude of, of the, the phaser. So it's uh, yeah, the level of voltage, 230 volts or 400 volts, depending on, on where you are in the grid. Uh, so if you know AC, usually there's also, this is a complex number and usually there's a phase as well. But today I will try to not talk so much about the phase. And this is actually possible to eliminate this as we'll come back to under this assumption that we are looking at radial grids. So V will be the just magnitude. And correspondingly L here would be the magnitude of the current on this line. Uh, again, so it will no, no face on, on, the, on the current. P uh, sub IK will be the active <clears throat> power flow on this line. So coming from bus I going towards bus K. And if you know AC, there's always a, re a reactive power flow. I will not go into the definitions of these. Uh, I suppose most people have seen that already in their studies. But just to remind you, I mean, active power is what we uh, usually pay for and consume when we turn on the light, watch TV, or watch uh, Zoom lectures. Uh, but there's always this reactive element, which is basically more or less the, the, uh, the power that we're bouncing back and forth in, in the inductive elements. And it's also very important to keep that one in mind because as you will see, it affects the voltage levels. So we're mainly paying for the active power, but there's always the reactive element, uh, the reactive power we need to think about. And in these diagrams, usually the reactive powers are have as a, a line here across like this. So that's the flows. Uh, injections, uh, I only use one index, PK. And we define them to be positive when it goes into the uh, bus. Uh, so often in, in the, this might be a negative injection, a consumption. So if we're now using our computers, watching a Zoom lecture, this would be a negative uh, active injection. Uh, but we might also inject some reactive power here. So this is the net net load of our household, let's say, into, into the distribution grid. So the sum of active and reactive element. And, and <clears throat> we might also have a reactive power consumption, here, depending on what type of loads we have. Here. For instance, a solar, uh, a solar power device usually have an, an, um, an uh, inverter, a uh, power inverter that we can control. So we can, to some extent, shape a little bit how much uh, reactive power you may want to inject or consume here. This is something we will talk about because that can help us to regulate the, the power here. Uh, yes, what else? RIK is the resistance down, yes, and XIK is the reactance. I already said that, I think. Okay. This is distribution flow. And to model these relations between these, these um, quantities, we, we will use the so-called dist flow equation. So it's distribution flow for short. Uh, and they uh, show up many places. I think they were first derived in reference one, Baran and Vu. So all my references are listed at the end of this this lecture on the slides there. So I will. Uh, I think Stephen Lowe, who is the final speaker today, will also talk about these equations quite a lot. So this one of the references here is, is to his his work in this area. Um, and as I also already mentioned, uh, and is indicated by these choice of variables, uh, the phase will not play a major role here. And uh, in fact, you can also eliminate the current magnitude. Uh, and often you talk about the so-called power flow problem. So what is the power flow problem? Typically it's something like this, that assuming we know the voltage level at the top of the grid. So top of the grid here would be typically the secondary substation. Let's move back a bit here, what I mean by V0. So V0 could be here, for instance, this voltage level here. Assume I know the voltage at this level, then you would like to 
compute the voltage levels down the line here. Here, this is the, this is the communication grid. Here is the physical grid. I would like to compute the voltage levels on this points here. Um, let's go back. Here, there. And I assume also I know how much consumption I have or injection I have in each of these nodes. So the problem is then, as I said, I would like to find the voltage level in, in, the, in each node. And I also like to compute how much power is flowing on the lines. So this is interesting, for instance, for safety reasons, because voltage should be within a certain, for safety reasons, should be within a certain interval, typically uh, in the household around 230 volts. And the power flows on the lines should not be too large or too, yeah, too large basically because of safety reasons. So often you would like to, to check that or dimension the system so that these, these values are within safety margins. So that's a power flow problem. And it's often shows up in, in uh, power system studies. Um, please tell me if I'm going to too slowly here, but we will speed up a little bit shortly. So uh, <clears throat> here the equations popped up and I should say this problem here has, uh, this problem here has a unique solution for practical networks. Uh, typically if the voltages in each level here is around one per unit, so often we, we will normalize all variables here. Uh, so unitless, so voltage around one basically mean you're around the nominal voltage and the resistance and the reactance are relatively small so this is in practical cases often the case so we will assume this in this talk here so that there's always a unique solution because this is a the relations between these variables is non-linear so it's not obvious that there is always a unique solution but under these conditions that is the case so here are now the dist flow equations in blue so let's what do they say uh, they say, for instance, that uh, if we look at bus K here, it says that the power PIK going into that node, if we subtract the injection here, that should equal all the active power going out to the neighbors. So it's more or less active power conservation, but there is a loss. So some active power is being lost on the line here, which is the resistance times the squared currents, Ri squared. So this is the ohmic loss, which you're maybe familiar with. So it's more or less, if you forget about this term, it's just saying that the flow coming in here is equal to the sum uh, and subtract the consumption, it's equal to what's going out. So that's very natural, but then there are some loss. Similarly, on the, on the reactive side, uh, the reactive power fulfills a similar relation, except now that instead of an ohmic loss, there is this, uh, let's say, oscillation of power in the inductive elements here. That uh, it's the reactance times the current squared. Um, the voltage levels, uh, voltage level squared, fulfills this equation. Uh, so it more or less says that the voltage level in this bus. Uh, is equal to the voltage level in this bus minus these linear terms, which is linear now in the flow in the active power and the reactive power. And here you already see what I mentioned that we need to think about the reactive, even though we're only paying for the active power, you see that the reactive power on the line here, it will influence the voltage levels here. So if there's a very large reactive power flow here on this line and there's not the, and we need to take the reactants into account, it will decrease the voltage level in this point here, which the customer is paying for a certain voltage level here, right? So if the voltage level is too slow here, uh, too low here, the, <clears throat> the distribution company is not delivering what it promised and there is a fee associated with that. And if it's too high, it's a safety hazard. So we need to make sure that this voltage level is, is, is within bounds. And then there is a, a, a loss term here that involves the squared current. There's also a relation between the, um, the, um, the squared, um, the squared uh, currents. 
and the squared voltage. This, this, uh, the product of those is equal to the, the squared active power plus the, react, the squared reactive power. This is more or less the, the magnitude squared of the so-called complex power, but I will not go into that. Uh, but <clears throat> as I mentioned here, you can eliminate the currents. So why is that? Well, you already see that here in this equation, right? You see it's I squared here, I squared there, I squared there. If I put this in, I substitute in this last equation here. We have three equation only in the active and reactive power powers and the voltage levels. So that's why this problem here is, is a well-defined problem. Again, assuming a radial network, because then these equations are enough to, to, to solve the problem. Okay, <clears throat> move on. No questions so far? No. Um, we will simplify these equations a little bit for the work today. And this is commonly done. We will linearize them. So it's not simple enough for us just yet. Uh, so linearized distribution flow, it's called a leanest flow in the literature in the same references as before. And it's more or less that we drop the, the quadratic terms related to these losses. So here are the same equations again. So the ohmic loss on the line was R times current squared. So <clears throat> if the currents are relatively small or the resistances on the lines are relatively small, so if the lines here are not too long, for instance, between the house households, this term here is very small compared to, to the actual power flows on the line. So we basically drop that term, that term, and that term. And we obtain the red equations here, which is then called the lean list flow. And you see it's even simpler. And here you have this exact power conservation. So you see that the active, if you sum the active power along every bus, you get zero. So the flows going out, is equal exactly to what comes in minus the consumption. Same for the reactive power. So, so this is a lossless, lossless approximation. So basically, as long as this approximation is, is fine, it will be, uh, these equations are quite accurate. And the accuracy of these equations is discussed in some of these references. And the voltage equation, this is actually the main equation we will use today also simplifies. You see there's a linear relation now between the squared voltage in the in the uh, in the buses and the, um, the flows on the lines. Uh, I'm not done simplifying. I will actually make one final uh, it's a little bit annoying that it's the voltage squared. Uh, so we will actually it's more for convenience it's not super necessary but if the voltages now are around one uh, so, so it's basically the um, the per unit so it's around nominal not too far away from nominal we basically can approximate the difference of the squares as two times the difference uh, and this is also done in reference to it's it's one of uh, Stephen Lowe's papers uh, and this is accurate, again, under the same assumptions as before, that there are small losses and also that there's a relatively flat voltage profile, so not too large deviations from one. Uh, yes, I have please. a question. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, actually, why can't we just consider V square and L square as a variable? And then if we look in this way, all are linear. Uh, why do we? consider L square as a variable. So you consider this thing as one term and V square as one term, then this equation is more or less linear. Just the th fourth equation is still bilinear. Yes. Oh, but, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, I, I think uh, there are quite a lot of works that's trying to handle this final uh, I mean, if you eliminate if you eliminate L square, you see that you it, it it's not uh, it's not linear in V one square, right? You, you will have 
division by v squared here, and you have v squared here, right? So it's it's a nonlinear equation in v squared. Are you? Uh, what I mean is that instead of using v, we consider v squared as a as a lump variable. We and we do optimization. We just optimize v squared instead of of optimizing u v. Why don't we do this thing? In in uh, this case, the problem uh, here here, uh, here you mean? Yeah, yeah. In, instead of writing v e uh, v equal to a uh, v k equal to v i minus blah blah blah, we say directly we just use v square as one term instead of considering as a quadratic term. Yeah, m m many many people do that. Uh, I mean, as you, as you mentioned, these red equations are already linear in B squared, right? So I, I could just yeah. work with B squared. Indeed, I, I can do that. Uh, it's just that uh, we found it more convenient to work directly with, uh, because often these, uh, yeah, what, what's a good, uh, as you said, it, it's already linear, right? So it's, it's, it's a more a convenience and you get rid of this factor too. And the, these tend to be quite large, Especially if you don't normalize the quantities, if you if you square, it, it's but indeed it, it's 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 it's, it's uh, in in some many treatments actually you you work you call this new instead of v square you call this new and you work directly with v square. So indeed, I mean this is more uh, maybe a, a convenience. So it's it's not a really critical uh, critical assumption. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, but I, I just want to say. Uh, uh, that the exact, uh, the exact uh, uh, dist flow equations going back to 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 here, it's quite a big area in in um, to make a convex relaxation of, of the, and using the exact equations and actually show that you you can work with these uh, exact equations and I think Stephen Lowe will talk more about this at the at the uh, Final lecture today in, in optimal power flow studies, you, you basically use these exact equations and show that you, you can handle this. So uh, we, we haven't done that in this work today, uh, and we will just use these very simplified equations. It's it's uh, at least to me it's more uh, it's it's more intuitive to think about voltages in in basically V is more or less what we measure in the wall, right? It's two hundred and thirty volts. Typically, and here you see it directly. So instead of thinking about the squares, but indeed it's it's just a, it's not a critical. Uh, but you see this quite a lot in, in the literature. All these three models you, you will find in the literature. And I, as I said, I think you will see uh, much more about this exact this flow model in the lecture by Stephen Law. <clears throat> Any more question about the model? See. So uh, here is how you can write uh, these equations in a matrix vector form. This is often how it's used if you're writing code. I think especially if you're looking in large scale uh, applications, many Many consumers, you'd like to write it in a matrix vector form. Uh, so here, here it is. Again, we have a radial grid. Uh, so V0, again, typically is the voltage level now in the uh, secondary substation. And these are connection points. At, at the end of each line here, you can think about it's a customer. And we assume there are N plus one buses and N branches, because it's, it's a tree. And uh, V0 now uh, is uh, in the power flow problem, it's assumed to be given. So we know, we know what this voltage level is, at least for, for now. And the vector V now here <clears throat> are the unknowns, the vector, uh, the, the voltage levels in these points. Uh, the active and reactive power injections is called P. 
uh, and Q. So the injections in these points here. I should say that it's it's uh, in P now it's n elements, so it's injections in these points here. So notice that if I know the injections in these points here by power by losslessness, we basically can compute how much power is needed to be injected in the in the substation here to fulfill the. So that's that's a, a dependent variable. So so P and Q here are are uh, are enough. And then the resistances and reactances are put into what is called the matrix uh, reactance and resistance matrices R and X. So we'll come back to that. So more or less the relation between these variables now can be written in this form. So the vector of voltages is more or less the level of voltage in the supply. And then there is a linear correction now depending on the injections and the, and the injections of uh, reactive power. Notice now I've eliminated the flows. So this is an equation only in the voltages and in the uh, injections. And of course, I can do this elimination. It's quite simple, right? It's basically using these conservation. So if I know the all the injections, I can basically eliminate the, uh, the flows in this equation recursively. And that's basically how I get this, this, this form here. And there are efficient methods for constructing these react, reactive uh, uh, resistance matrix and uh, reactance matrix. Uh, it's a lemma to show that these matrices are symmetric and positive definite uh, if the tree is connected. And that is being shown in this reference uh, for those who are interested. Um, it's not it's super hard to show. So how do I how do I find those entries in this? If, if I look at the grid like this, how do I find the entries in this matrix? How should I think about this? Well, here's a rule of rule how to do it. To find entry R sub i k in this matrix or x i k, it's the same. You should connect bus i and k uh, to the uh, root of the tree. And you should add all the resistances or reactances, then depending on Rx, that are in, in intersection intersecting on these two, two connections. So it's an example. Here are some examples. Let's take element R43. So four and three. So if we connect now bus four to zero, it's basically here up to zero. And from three, it's here to zero. And the common branch is basically only this one here, right? So element R43 is more or less only the line resistance on that line here. Uh, R33, it's uh, here. Well, it's only one line. So what's the, the uh, you just connect three to zero. It's there and there. So we add the line resistance here and here. So it's these two. And for instance, the reactance element of x45, 4, 4, and 5, we follow up to the root. So it's these two here, right? So it's x01 and x12. So 01 basically means from 0 to 1. So that's how you construct these matrices. So it's, it's very, very fast to, 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 for a given network to basically construct these matrices. And as I said, they, these are symmetric and positive definite if it's a connected tree. Uh, just to write out, to give some intuition for this, this equation, uh, I just write out uh, line, uh, the voltage level in, in five here, just to show you how, how should I think about this. So if I write out the fifth line of this equation, so here it is. So the fifth voltage down here, well, let's start from the top. It's the voltage in the top. And then now remember, uh, this is a flow conservation network. So basically all the power, all the active power being consumed about in all these leaves down here, all of that comes from the top. So think about it as, uh, so all power that goes out here needs to come from the top. So all of that power goes through that line. So this is the sum the sum of all power, and if it's consumption, this is a negative number. 
and it has to go through the uh, resistance here. So the voltage V5 is first, we have a voltage drop here that is equal to this. Okay, so then we are at this point here in V1. This is how much power, voltage we lost, more or less, because of all of that power that goes through. And then we move on to the next, next edge. So we want to R5, so we go down here on this section. So all power that is consumed there, there, and there has to go through that segment. So then we lose an additional voltage if it's negative. That is the sum of that power times R12. And then finally, there's a power in P5 here down here. It's only that power that goes through that. So then we lose an additional. So here you see now the <clears throat> But there's coupling between the uh, the voltage level. The voltage level in this customer here is being affected by everybody else's consumption in the uh, in the grid. And this is something when I come to the scheduling problem, we will look at scheduling of loads. So as people inject or consume uh, inject or consume uh, power, that that will 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 uh, affect voltage level five. Oh, I should say, uh, this only takes the two first terms into account here, V0 and RP. Of course, there's, uh, I should also have added uh, exactly the same equations, but with, uh, with the reactive injections, right? So in addition to the active consumption in every customer, there's always also reactive terms here that just mirror this. And uh, as I already mentioned, uh, this is a lossless model. So if I sum up all the consumption in, in the nodes here, uh, I, this is it's equal to the, uh, to the injection here. As, as the question I got before, why, don't, why did I don't work with the V squared? Of course, the equations, if I want to work with V squared instead and have a little bit more accuracy, I, uh, I have exactly the same equations here. It should be these. Yeah the vector of v squares and should be v zero squared here and i need to put in a two factor two here right because to account for for uh, for the two here so it's indeed very very possible to work with v squared here it's still lossless so that was when it's when you're using this lean the linear dist flow models either in v squared or v you always have this conservation of power. If you use the exact dist flow equations, you do account for the losses in the lines. Uh, the price is that it becomes nonlinear, uh, but that might be very important to you if you're doing, for instance, optimal power flow where you're trying to minimize, optimize the production. You, you, I mean, the goal of that activity is actually to minimize the losses in the system, right? So that then it becomes important to, becomes important to, uh, to, uh, to take those losses into account. So depending on what your application is, uh, one model might be more suitable than the other. But I think this linear model, linear approximation gives a lot of insight. It gives you some understanding about how, how the voltage levels in the different customers is affected by everybody else's. And you see here also that the customers that are most sensitive are more or less the ones far away so sometimes you talk about electrical distance and a weak connection. A weak connection is, is if you're very far from the supply, you have a lots of resistances down to your house. Then you're basically, you're sensitive. There are lots of terms that are basically perturbing your, your, your voltage. Whereas if you're up here, V1, for instance, it's only this small resistance R01 that will sort of affect you. So, so if that resistance is small, it doesn't really matter. You have a strong connection to the grid, uh, whereas these five here might have a weak connection to the grid and you're more sensitive to, to, to the consumption pattern of others. So that, that your distance to the supplies is actually an important factor to take into account. Okay, um, I think this might be a good Going to take a little break. I don't know what Ognian, if you have any 
Do you agree? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree. Yeah. Uh, so would you like uh, 10 or 15 minutes? Uh, we have, so your time slot is until 10.30. Uh, we, we can take, um, maybe we take 10 minutes. If that's fine. All right, sounds good. Uh, I, I will be, uh, I'll, I'll be around here if there's any questions so far for these 10 minutes. But yes, let's take a break. All right, great. See you in 10 minutes.
see. So Agnian, are you turned back? Uh, yep. Yeah. So has it been 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. I think we can start again. Yeah. Okay. So now we've uh, seen uh, some of the models that we will be using. Uh, so more or less, we will use this uh, this type of models now to uh, address the uh, the problem I mentioned in in brief in the beginning, namely this application. How how do we roll out and con configure systems? Uh, to uh, and ensure safety more or less. So for instance, now we have an understanding that the, uh, the uh, consumption of power and reactive power would affect the voltage. How, how do we ensure things like uh, that the voltage levels will stay within safety bounds? So that's more or less the, the uh, how, how we, we will proceed. So this problem, which I call now the minimum time secure rollout of software updates. Now the optimization part of the talk will come. Uh, so here is uh, a benchmark grid that some of you probably have seen. It's the Sigre benchmark model. I will come back to it. Um, but this is, I think, a realistic grid. So we have the, the substations uh, up here, and you see this tree structure here, the three branches, three branches connected to the V0, so V0 will be up here. And here you have some loads. This is a 400 volt network. Uh, and we will assume here that now there are some smart uh, devices here, uh, inverter control devices, loads or generation. So it could be a solar panel, I don't know, so it could be a charger for a battery for a for electric cars or something like this. So it's a controllable device that can more or less decide how much injection of active and reactive power. And of course it has a control system and it can be now updated. So assuming now we have this communication network here as well, where we can more or less communicate to these control devices, uh, so how should we communicate with these devices and more or less make sure that they do not, for instance, all of them starts to consume maximum power simultaneously, uh, which would then affect the voltage levels in every node, which might violate. So basically in every point of this grid, we need to ensure that the voltage levels is within the safety limits under all possible consume consumption behaviors. And you understand now if this is a very large network, this is not super large, then, then you, there's lots of combinations that you, you need to, to consider. Uh, so the particular <clears throat> control function I will talk about here is volt var control and up, updated such control mechanisms. So these controllable devices, uh, often the uh, one function that they, they come with is that you can you can inject reactive power depending on the voltage level, the local voltage level. So here is a figure. So there might be a solar panel. And there, here's the inverter that takes the DC to AC and it injects the, uh, the uh, reactive power into the grid. And we've already saw in the model that this will affect the voltage level here, but also the voltage level everywhere else in the, in the grid. Here is a typical function of how the injected reactive power will depend on the, um, the, the measured. So it's a, it's, a, it's a local control loop, decentralized. So generally, uh, if the voltage level is so this would be the nominal value here in the middle. So as long as you're within sort of the uh, a good uh, some some safety margin or something that you think find acceptable. So generally around 400 volts or 230 volts, you don't inject any active uh, reactive power. Uh, but if the voltage goes too high, 
the idea now is generally that this device starts to consume reactive power. So you can set this controller here now to start to consume. So it will pull down reactive power and that will try to, as you remember the equations now, the dist flow equations, if I start to consume reactive power that will pull down the voltage in this point. Why is this interesting? Well, for solar power, it's very often so that it's the active part. So here I only talk about the, the reactive component. There's also active power. Uh, and often that's controlled using some maximum power point tracking, basically saying that the solar panel is always trying to inject the maximum active power it can. So if the sun shines a lot, it pumps in a lot of active power. Again, based on the dist flow equations, you know that the active power, if I push it in, it will pull, push the voltage up. So if it's a sunny day, the voltage will tend to go up because everybody's pumping in active power. It's available. It's good, we, sh we should use that. Uh, but if the voltage level is too high, it's above the safety limit. Of course, then that's a security hazard. And typically what will happen then is that then you need to turn these off. Another idea then is that you instead starts to consume uh, reactive power and that will exert the force downwards to compensate. So you could imagine that the reactive power is trying to compensate for the active. So that's why this might be an interesting scheme. That is, and it's a scheme that's being considered now. Uh, these set points and this curve here might be adjusted and that could be done centrally. So this communication system, for instance, that you have to the substations, secondary substation, that could be basically communicate to, to this controller here and, and adjust these points, attach, uh, change the slopes or change the, these uh, dead zone here, etc. So, so that's basically an update. And this, this talk, for instance, we would like to, to change this setting depending on the, the uh, for instance, the, the weather forecasts or that you have discovered a security problem in the software or, or something that may threaten security. There's a local control but there's possibility to affect these settings here. That's that's a typical up software update in, in this talk. So parameter software update, for instance, if the operating condition changes, or for instance, also cyber security threat, for instance, as I mentioned, happens. So we would like to think about how do we communicate with these devices so that <clears throat> we can, uh, without creating a hazard for the system. Uh, we call this inverter software update rollout problem and it's taken from the fourth reference. Uh, so again, the goal is to update a lot of these inverters, all of them. Uh, we want to do this in minimum time. We call this the make span. So the total time from we start, we want to communicate with all of these remote devices in our grid and update them in some form, either reset the parameters or we, we change the control system. We wanna minimize that time, uh, but we, uh, we, we need to take this possible, uh, we also want to take into account that the possibility that there might be failures. So it's not a good idea, for instance, to update all of these devices simultaneously, because if there's a fault and all of them starts to fail, that, that may, as we've seen in, in the, the equations for the Lindis flow, that may make, make all cause a voltage problem. So we will make a schedule. We should only, we should only so update- There is a question in the chat. Yes, uh, uh, I see. We only want to update as many as we can safely do at any given time. So I'll read out the question here. This control scheme typically considers the only the point of connection or also sorry, on the other buses. Yes, we consider all buses. So the problem is more or less the following. So just to, I, I, I was as I asked the question. So we assume it's a centrally, uh, 
this control scheme is, is controlled from uh, somewhere centrally, right? For all the buses, okay. Yeah, <clears throat> there is a control center here. Okay. I would like to dispatch uh, software to all of these or settings. Uh, but we would like to ensure that safety constraints are fulfilled at, at every point here. We don't have, we haven't looked into a distributed solution to this problem, but indeed that's, that would be an interesting, uh, interesting. So it's, it's a centralized, it will be a centralized uh, problem here, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I just try to argue that it's not a good idea to just ship, send them out, all, update simultaneously everything because then there might be a, a, a voltage. Oh, sorry. We call this an N minus N security constraint uh, in quotation marks. So in, secure, in, in power systems, you always talk about N minus one security, basically meaning that you, you can accept at any given time, you can accept one fault in any one device and that, that will not threaten any safety constraints. Here we will assume that we will update N buses and any one of them can fail at any given, uh, one or all of them can fail. And we need to take that into account. I take this into quotation mark because uh, as we design a, an update schedule here, uh, we will basically spread it out over time so, to avoid that actually all of them happen at the same time. We will we'll get back to that. That's why I have quotation marks here. So it's more than one fault at any, any given time, but yeah, you, you, you will see that. We also want to solve this uh, scheduling problem quickly. Uh, so we would like not to wait too long. We don't want to sit and compute a schedule forever. It, it should be relatively fast uh, because the operating points change uh, may change time quickly, and we need, and if it's security weakness, we would like to basically make the change quickly and not wait too long. So, so that's also another uh, another desire here. Um, and we will use this linearized disk flow model here, as we already introduced to you. We have not used the full flow model, the nonlinear one, which might be interesting. Uh, is it, there's not a question here. Is it assumed that during software update, the power injection from the inverter is interrupted? Uh, yes, we will, uh, since we linearize, it's a linearized uh, point. We will assume basically that the, uh, we're, we are at, so zero would be kind of the nominal condition and zero would be kind of be the, the correct. Uh, uh, I, I, will, uh, I, will, I will come to that, but uh, we, we don't, since we have a, li a linear uh, operation point, I, I think the, uh, the idea is that we're kind of have, have a, the normal operation is still there. And the only thing the update can do is basically it, it may destroy that. It, it may start to inject or consume in an erratic pattern. So, so I wouldn't say that we assume that we turn everything off. Uh, but of course, it depends on a little bit on, on, the, on, the, on the control. Uh, here, here is what we, what we will use. So we basically use now the, this linear part of the, uh, of the, uh, the Lindist flow equation. So delta Q here, uh, that is basically the uh, possible, if I make a software update to a device, uh, that is basically the, uh, that update, how it may change the, uh, the injection of reactive power. And that will affect now the voltage levels linearly, uh, delta V in all the other nodes by this reactance matrix. So delta Q equals to zero basically means that the update basically function as it should. We're, we're following the normal trajectory. A delta Q larger than zero basically mean that the update somehow did not do what it should. So zero in this part of the talk is basically a good thing. So that's then we're on track. I don't know if that answered the question. <clears throat> um, then we... Uh, 
have some notation here. So a software update at bus J. So the device is bus J it will occur at time T sub J. And we say an update fails. Uh, we will assume that that will cause now uh, a disruption of the voltage in all other buses in the time interval tied Tj to Tj plus tau. So a failure here in this talk, as I said already, it basically means that we start to have a delta Q in that device that is non-zero. So zero again is that it, it, things are going as it should. The update is successful. The, the, uh, the device is doing what it should. Uh, but if delta Q is non-zero, it basically means that it's starting to behave as it should. It, it basically is between some limits. I mean, every device in our grid has a rating. It has a maximum injection and minimum injection. Uh, so it's between those two bounds. Uh, but we will assume here that there is an upper time limit tau, and this is where the quotation mark in n minus n comes in. So this tau here is basically an update period tau. This is a uh, this is also where the centralized aspect of this problem comes into. So we assume that there exists a time, a clearing time tau, where we're monitoring. So we install the update at time tj. And then we're watching the grid for a time period tau to see whether the update was successful or not to verify it. And after the time period tau, we assume that it was fine. We have basically gotten uh, an acknowledgement from the device that everything is working. So this is a imp very important assumption in this work, which I will return to in the, at the very end about the future work. But there exists a time period tau the clearing time where we basically so we assume somehow that this centralized scheduler it's installed the update at tj and then it's it's monitoring the device to check and confirm that the update worked and if it's fine for tau time period tau then it will move on uh, and then finally i will also say that I, we will normalize this matrix x so everything should be between, uh, so the disruption should be less than one. So X we normalize with the maximum allowed voltages. So we call that matrix H sub IJ. So normalized X is HIJ. So everything should be less than one. So maximum disruption is one. So H now is, it will be this reactants, normalized reactants X. All right. Uh, so, for example, let's let's look at a single update failure at bus J. So, uh, this is how it could look. So, a failure now, as I said, basically means that this device here is being updated at time tau, tau J. Uh, it starts to either inject or uh, consume reactive power. Delta Q is different from zero. For instance, in this figure, we assume it's positive. In, in all of my slides here, we will assume it's, it's a positive. Fault is positive injection. So it raises the voltage. But since the models are linear in this talk, it doesn't really matter the sign. Uh, so, but for, so think about that this device is being updated at tau, time tau j. It's the failure, the update fails and it starts to inject the maximum reactive power can. And now by the this flow equations, that basically means that every every device here on, on, on this uh, the uh, on the branch, same branch will experience a race in, in voltage depending on its distance and location with respect to this. So here is the local voltage change as a rise. Uh, but this matrix, the normalized matrix HIJ, now it will basically measure how much you will impact the voltage here and here and everywhere else, of course. So if the <clears throat> if this is a well-designed system, a single failure here would not threaten voltage level. This bump in the voltage will not be, it should be below 
the safety limit. If it's not, I mean, then this system is basically, in, it's not a safe system. It's not even M minus one secure, right? So, so that's that we will assume that, that you, you can tolerate a single failure. Uh, but let's say now that there's multiple failures now, and these are now, I think the next slide, multiple failures now, and since we assume linearity, we will have superposition, of course, of the disruptions. Uh, oh, I should say also here in, in this figure, here you see this uh, tau, this critical parameter tau. So let's assume there's a failure now. Uh, I notice that there is a failure and there's a clearing time tau. So what I do during this time is basically, I notice that I have a failure here and I basically turn off that device. So after time tau, this device is off the grid. It's it's off. So I don't need to think about it. That, that was a failure. I need to, I will deal with that after I'm done with the rollout. So after that time, this is gone. So that you realize now the criticality of this parameter that I can basically forget about it afterwards. Uh, but here, here you see now if there's multiple failures, you will have additions. And here you know, now see that why it's a bad idea to update everything simultaneously, because if all of these devices fail, this may now add up to, to multiple voltage violations in the grid. So uh, the problem is more or less now the following. Uh, I would like to find the update times. So every device should be updated at time tau sub i. Uh, uh, but these updates are now intertwined because of the, the physical coupling between the devices. And we will consider the worst case scenario, which is now the uh, which is now the uh, 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 typical way to do safety. Uh, so more or less the following problem. We wanna minimize uh, the maximum, the last, this means the max tau i, the last update, the, the, last, the last device to be updated should be as small as possible. We want to finish this rollout as quickly as possible. We don't want to wait until next year to update everything. So as fast as possible, we want to update everything, but at any given time, uh, we cannot tolerate any voltage violation anywhere in the grid for all times and all buses for any possible failure condition. So that's kind of the, the problem here. And, and this is a non-smooth, non-linear programming problem. So in solution process is difficult as formulated, uh, but, under our assumption of, on the existence of this tau clearing time, it uh, simplifies. Uh, so we will propose an equivalent protractable reformulation of this problem now as using this assumption. And the first result now is basically to show that more or less without loss of generality there, this becomes a time slotted. The optimum can be without loss of generality it becomes a time slotted. Uh, uh, problem. So any optimal update time can occur at any integer multiple of this tau. So tau becomes basically the, the scheduling period. Uh, so more or less what I'm saying is that we don't need to, these update times, they, they don't need to be reals. It's enough to think about this as a discrete problem. And the intuition is, is quite simple. Here, here you see three different uh, scenarios. So these blocks here, illustrates a voltage perturbation by an update. So here are three different possible update scenarios. So this device is updated here, and this one's updated here, and the length of these intervals is tau. What you can notice now is more or less that if you round down to the nearest integer multiple of tau, uh, this starting time, you will notice that, of course, you will not, the schedule will be not longer, than the schedule here. The final time will, will not be larger and, and no safety constraint will be violated. So here, for instance, this slot will happen here and this slot will happen there. Uh, there's no point where the voltage constraint is violated if it's not violated here. Same thing here, right? Here, we assume that the safety constraint is not violated here. And if both of them start here instead of there and there, it's still not. So it's basically showing that we can project down 
this optimum to an optimum that is no worse. So it's no loss in generality to assume. But here we, of course, we use this existence of the tau, this uh, clearing time. Um, so the updates becomes discrete and finite. Uh, and we can use now finite discrete optimization tools. We can use greedy methods, integer programming, constraint programming, and different meta heuristics. There are lots of opportunities here. Uh, I will offer you one uh, interpretation of the problem, which we call the multi resource bin packing problem. So, bin packing is a classical problem in, in uh, combinatorial optimization. And our problem can be thought about as, as a multi resource problem. So what is what do I mean by that? So more or less the following. So uh, we want to assign updates. So every update I think now about uh, as an item, an item of a certain size that I would like to put in a bin, and a time slot is a bin. Uh, so an update is a potential perturbation. That's the size. The size of my item is basically how large perturbation it is, and a time slot. If I pack too many updates in the same time slot, I will potentially threaten the voltage safety. Right? So the bin, the size of the bin, and now the, the multi-resource is basically that every, every node in my grid now is, is a bin. So that's why it's a multi-resource. So typically in bin packing, there's only one box or there's only, uh, there's only one, there's only uh, not, not one box, but there's only one sort of one node to pack. Where you can fit in boxes. Now we have sets of boxes in every different node. Uh, so more or less here is a single, this is a single node uh, in my grid. So this is a more or less a bin packing problem. So every, here is the size of an update in bus 21. This is the potential voltage perturbation. And then if I update in bus 32, this is the size of that perturbation. This is 33 and 39. If I pack all of these, if I update these devices simultaneously, even if all of them fail, I will not threaten the voltage safety in this in this particular uh, in this particular uh, node. This is the next time slot. So this is one bin packing problem. Now I have this bin packing problem every single. I have this problem in every single node in, in the grid. So I have one of these schedules in every, every, every single node. So that's why we call it the multi-resource <clears throat> bin packing problem. I know if this is, picture is clear, but I hope you understand this analogy with the bin, bin packing. And of course, this is an interesting problem in, in logistics where you want to ship, you want to send as few boxes as possible, right? You want to ship all of these items so all of these items are updates. We want to we want to uh, to ship them all. We want to update them all, and we want to use as few boxes as possible, as few time slots as possible. That's why it's a resource. I've been packing. There are many heuristics available to to this. Type of problem, at least the uh, at least the bin the classical bin packing problem. There are many heuristics available. Uh, for instance, the adapt first fit descend FFD, I will call it, or best fit descend EFD heuristics. Uh, just to give you an, some intuition, the heuristics work basically. The way it works, more or less, is that you you sort all of the all of the bins that you would like all, all of the items you would like to pack you sort them in decreasing size and then you take the largest one and you fit it in the first box that you can then you proceed to the next largest item and if it fits in the first one you put it there and then you proceed to the third item and so on if it doesn't if the second item is too big to fit here you put it in the second box so you basically fill from the bottom and this is some n log n scheme and you can prove actually if you only have a single bin packing problem this this, this actually comes quite close to the optimum but bin packing is an empty hard problem and we'll get back to that so, so the, the true optimum is, is hard to find but this simple heuristic actually works uh, relatively well uh, 
but now the problem for us is that we don't have a single it's not a single resource bin packing problem we have we have lots of different resources so what we did here we we created a heuristic based on this more or less we uh, we take the sum of the magnitudes of for every uh, update to basically measure the size over the entire grid. So the size, we, we, we create basically the, the size of a, of, a, of a single update is the total perturbation over the entire grid in all devices. And then we sort them in a decreasing order. So that is a heuristic. Uh, we've not been able to prove that this is uh, any suboptimality guarantee of this, but I, I will show you that this tends to work very well in, in practice. It's very fast. Yeah, so this is more or less what I said. You, you, you sort all of the updates in decreasing ability to cause disruption, and then you assign them one at a time at the first acceptable time slot without violating any constraint in any node. So this is a greedy algorithm, and it has good quality, as you, as you will see, at least in the examples we've. And the time complexity is n log n but we don't know any optimality gap for, for, for this multiple bin case. In the single bin case, as I said, there's well-known bounds. I, I will show what the bound is at some of my later slides, my final slide, I think. So that's just one heuristic uh, that one can come up with. Uh, another approach is actually to pursue the true optimum of this problem, <clears throat> to actually try to find the, uh, what is the best possible solution. And, We've done that by formulating it as an integer linear program. Uh, and for that, you need to introduce binary variables. Uh, we have done it in the following way. We have introduced variables y sub j, which are 0 and 1. So basically, y sub j is more or less that if time slot j is occupied or not. So basically, it means, do I have I scheduled any update at time slot j? Uh, in a variable x sub ij, 0, 1, it basically means that I have update. My update in, in bus number i will be assigned to time slot j. And then the objective, I want to minimize the make, make span, the total time, right? So I want to minimize the sum of an, the number of up. So basically, yj is basically whether or not I have updated in time, time slot j. So the sum of all all of the y, yj basically becomes the total, that becomes the total time it takes for me to, to, to send out all of the, this one way to formulate the make span problem using discrete variables. And then I have constraints. So I would like all of the buses to have the up software updated. So basically the sum over index j, xij for all i should be equal to one. That ensures that at any given, at the end of the schedule, I've ensured that all of the uh, all of the updates have actually been assigned and no voltage violation for any uh, any node. So basically it's been, if I take my normalized reactance matrix HKIJ times the uh, slot XIJ, that should be less than y, YJ. So if there is an update, the given time, I cannot violate that safety constraint. That's just, this is one way of, of formulating the, the problem. So it's an exact reformulation of, of the problem using uh, an integer linear program. I'm not sure if you've used integer linear programs. I just, just to show you, this is the canonical form of an integer linear program. So it looks like a linear program, uh, except that the uh, the variable I optimize over x should be now an uh, uh, integer variable. It should belong to Zn. Uh, and C, B, and A here are integer, integer uh, vectors and matrices. Uh, of course, you can allow some of these variables to be reals, and then it's usually called a mixed integer linear program. So this is an MP complete problem. It's well known. So it already shows that but the problem here is, is uh, at least in, in its full generality, is, is hard. Uh, but there are many efficient solvers available based on branch and bound techniques, and the OB, CPLEX, and there also you can also form it using constraint programming, so ILOG CP and so on. So there are 
possibilities to solve these problems in, in quite to optimality in, in, in quite large sizes. So what I'm saying here is that we came up with a heuristic that is relatively simple to think about this bin packing analogy, uh, but you could also rewrite it as, as an integer linear programming like this. And then you could try some of these different solvers to see how it performs. <clears throat> Uh, I would like to say uh, just something about uh, how to increase the performance. Since the problem is MP, MP hard, uh, sometimes the, the, uh, it takes quite a long time or the software will not, will not terminate in, in any reasonable time. So what you can do, uh, for, for instance, in the for for these solvers, you can you can try to help the solver. Uh, so these solvers typically try to create basically trees of different uh, possibilities, and it tries to basically prune this tree to cut away solutions that are not uh, possible optimal solutions. You can try to help help the solver to find those to make those cuts. So here is what we call valid equations inequalities. So it's basically it's doesn't these inequalities one, two, and three here. They don't affect. If I add these constraints to my problem, they don't affect the optimal solution. It's still so it, it may seem like it's not really and you shouldn't add anything, but this it actually helps the solvers the way they work to more efficiently prune and cut away options. So these are three three equations we've been using. We call them valid equations. So this one, for instance, is quite trivial. It basically, since the problem is time invariant, you, you, you basically want to, to to just not you you want basically to push push this optimal solution to start at zero. We don't only want to minimize the total time. We want it. We say we want to start at zero. So basically, that cuts away a lot of combinations of that the uh, that the solver need to to investigate so that just basically sets the time frame we don't really i mean it's arbitrary time zero is arbitrary right uh, here is an, another very obvious constraint it basically says that if there exists uh, a bus so that the sum of hku plus hkw if that's greater than one it basically means that if i update bus u and w W at the same time, for sure, I will violate the constraint in bus K. If there exists such a sum here, for sure, I mean, I will, that will not, that's not a feasible solution. So basically, I can just add a constraint saying that this is not even, uh, by adding this constraint on X here, I, I can basically exclude the possibility that these are, are even tried. I don't even try to investigate that these are scheduled at the same time. So I basically help the solver. So of course it will figure this out by itself if you wait long enough, but here I basically say that it's, there's no reason to do this. And similarly, you can also find sometimes uh, sets of mutually exclusive updates. So for instance, you can create sets saying that all of these updates here, none of them can happen in the same time slot because that will violate so it's a generalization, you can say of this. So here are like valid, what we call valid equations. So as I said, again, it's not really, it should not affect the, the solution, the uh, optimal solution, but it does actually have, as you will see in the case studies, it does, does help. So if you investigate these type of tools uh, and think that it doesn't perform very well, you should, experiment to like add these type of similar sim seemingly simple constraints it actually can have a dramatic effect on the on the, uh, on, on the problem so exploit structures for instance that's another way so here's now the first case study uh, here's the european low voltage 40 bus grid again the one I, I showed in the beginning so we would like to update all of all, all the 40 buses here in this so we would like to uh, update all buses. We want to minimize the mix band and no voltage violation at any time. 
And here, rather arbitrarily, we chose the time slot to be 15 seconds. Clearly, it doesn't really matter. I mean, what tau is it depends on your system. What is a reasonable clearing time for your system to, to, to confirm that, that it works? But we set 15 here in this, this academic example. And to investigate some different, uh, see how the problem performs in this, we started to, to check what happens as you, you change the size. So clearly as you uh, in, in change the rating of the devices, uh, so the size of the devices to be updated. I mean, the larger perturbation, uh, queue that you can inject in a, de a device can inject into the grid the uh, intuitively it means basically that it will take longer time to safely update everything so basically to see how how how, um, how it performs um, we, we, we made out the variable that we will change and here are some scheduling results just to hear so basically what the output of this problem is a Gantt diagram uh, so for our grid in one, one size of the devices, we, we managed to update all the devices in six, six time slots, which with 15, time is 15 is 90 seconds. So the interpretation here is that during the first time slot, I should update these buses and I should confirm after in 15 seconds that they all work. And then I move on to these buses, these buses. And at the end of the 90 second, everybody's updated and I can tolerate failures in any given time here. And of course, if I've done this sequentially, it would have taken 40 time slots. So I've significantly cut down by doing this parallel uh, rollout. I, I basically cut down the time it will take to, to do the safe update. Uh, here, here, this is a diagram we already saw. This is one particular uh, bus. Uh, this was uh, bus 40, apparently. So the, the solution to the problem, it just, just verifies that the safety limits with this, with this particular, with this particular Gantt scheme, we will not violate any. So there, you can draw a similar figure for every single bus in, in the grid. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, as a variable, we increase the sizes of the devices. Uh, so here on this axis here, you basically see the, the magnitude. So the, the, how large, what's the rating of the, the, the devices in the 40 buses? So as I increase the sizes, I mean the, the, um, the injection power of, of these devices, uh, how many time slots in total does it take? to update everything and uh, clearly it's an increasing function i mean that's natural again because if it's two very large devices i cannot update them simultaneously probably because that would violate the constraints and here i also <clears throat> compare now uh, the red here is the number of slots i need when i solve the problem to full optimality so i'm, I'm using this integer linear program and I use these valid constraints. So this is the true optimum. There's no way to there's no way to solve this problem with fewer slots than this. And the blue now is this heuristic I mentioned. So more or less that what I said. Right, we think about this as a multi-resource bin packing problem. I sort all the updates in decreasing order, and I basically fit them in as the first available time slot. And you see, it's more or less always you obtain the same number of, not exactly the same schedule maybe because it's a non-unique schedule, but the, the minimum number of time slots you, you recover here, except in this particular case here. So it does happen that you don't find the, the true optimum, but very often, very often you, you come very, very close. So it indicates that this, this heuristics are very, it's very efficient. And it's very much quicker than running the uh, the uh, integer linear program. And here is just the uh, some statistics from this or experiments. So 
So what you see here is the time in seconds it took on our, it's based, it was a laptop, so not, 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 no fancy computer. So just a relatively normal laptop. So here you have the magnitude again of the devices. Here is the different combinations of solution strategies we've been thinking about. So let me go through that. So F1, M1, it's, it's now I think about the problem as a multi-resource bin packing. And then I use this greedy heuristic. So I sort things. So it's more or less, it's, it's, the, uh, it's the red here. And you see it's extremely fast. It's 0 0.0028 28 seconds. So it's more or less instantly you get most of the time the optimum schedule. Uh, F3, M2. Uh, F3 is basically the integer linear programming, and I add these valid constraints, one, two, and three. So these seemingly useless constraints. And I've solved it using, or we solved it using a branch and bound Gurobi solver, which is uh, available for free for academia. And you see here, this is the true optimum. It's still not very, uh, doesn't really take so much time. It's a 40 bus network, so, so it's a combinatorial problem with 40 buses, but there's quite a few number of integer variables. But you see if in less than a second, you, uh, you, um, uh, you, you find the, the true optimal solution. And you might wonder why the time goes down here. First, it goes up as you add bigger and bigger devices. It goes, the time goes up here, but then suddenly it goes down again. And actually, the reason for that is that this, it's these valid constraints. Uh, if you remember the valid constraints two and three, uh, what was that? It was these uh, here, these two. So if the device starts to get big, there was, will, it will start to happen that I cannot schedule two devices simultaneously. If the devices are very small, this will not happen. So more or less these two and three, they will not come into effect. So they will not help me. There are, there are basically no such valid constraints, but as the devices start to get bigger, I can trivially eliminate a lot of combinations. So there's basically much fewer branches to, to investigate. And that will explain to you actually when you have large devices, it's, it's much, it's actually a quicker, Problem. And you see that actually here as well. Uh, if you, uh, uh, yeah, just not, actually you see here at least that, that it, it is not uh, a dramatic, uh, uh, there's actually some, some uh, it goes down here as well. So actually the solver actually managed, managed to exploit some of that without those value constraints. But still, you see there's a big difference in time. So these valid constraints, it actually takes down the, the computation time here, especially right from half a second to 74 seconds. But just by adding these valid constraints, you get a lot of time. So it, it's really worthwhile to, to try to do that. We also try to use uh, constraint programming to solve the integer linear program, but in general, we have better luck with the branch and bound here. Uh, here is another uh, network, which is bigger, just to show you uh, uh, another, so 83 bus Taiwanese system. Uh, here you see some of the, uh, uh, the dashed line here are, are uh, uh, tie switches. So it's possibilities to re reconfigure the grid. As I said, it's uh, at any given time, you should have a tree structure, but you can reconfigure the tree. So you, you can cut, you can turn off this line and, and turn another line on. So that's possibilities for reconfiguration. Uh, but we use this configuration as seen here. And here is another, so it's much bigger grid, uh, but you see a very similar behavior uh, uh, in this 83 bus network. It's only, rather seldomly that this heuristic will not find the optimum, but we have not been able to prove any optimality bounds, as I said. <clears throat> Here's some computation time. Again, you see the heuristic, it's extremely fast for this larger grid. Here you see the computation time using the same solvers. Uh, in 
parentheses, you see the optimality gap. So we actually, uh, we set the solvers, Gurobi and the ILOG CP to terminate after 90 seconds. So we were a bit impatient. So after 90 seconds, we basically told the solvers to, to uh, give us their best solution I've found so far. Uh, the good thing with these uh, solvers is that when you terminate them prematurely before they found the optimal solution, it will come with an optimality gap. So it's often that they have a dual lower bound. So it will basically tell you uh, what's a lower bound on the, what's a lower possible what's a lower bound on the true optimum. So you can basically measure the current solution you have how far away in the worst case it is from the true optimum. This is the relative distance in percent here. Uh, so even, even when you terminate it, you, you can get useful information. And quite often you actually found the optimum solution in, uh, in, uh, within 90 seconds. Sometimes in some, in some cases you see that there's a worse distance. Actually, it's interesting to see here that <clears throat> the magnitude of the devices when it's around this, there's many, lots of combinations to investigate. So it takes mo most time here for medium size. When it's a kind of medium sized devices, there are so many combinations that you basically need to investigate. So it takes a long time for the solver. If it's a small devices, you can pack in a lot. It's not so hard. If it's very large devices, you know, it's not possible to squeeze in so many, so it's fewer combinations. But in the middle here, it takes a quite a long time to, to, um, to investigate. Um, yes, uh, I should say yeah. So in our studies, we did, we have we had better better luck with the branch and bound Gurobi solver than the constraint programming. So this was uh, uh, what I had to say about this application. Uh, just to summarize a little bit what I said. So this was a new, I think scheduling paradigm in the cyber physical uh, domain. So we will basically want to minimize this, what I call make span subject to this security constraint, which we call N minus N security. And under this assumption of the tau, this clearing period, it's a finite and discrete optimization problem when there is the, has this bin packing analogy that you, we can exploit at least to, to come up with good heuristics. So it is MP hard, the optimal problem. And I, I both presented you to you this heuristics and the, and the linear programming solution. And the interlinear programming uh, can be significantly in some cases be uh, speeded up by, by these valid constraints. Uh, but with the heuristic, you saw we, we even for a large network, we got a very good solution in, in like 0 0.00, 0 second, 0 0.01 seconds or something like this. Right? So we, we got very fast schedules. So, so extensions, there are many, of course, extensions available. This, uh, I think we still are interested in this problem. So one, one problem is, of course, one would like to use the exact list flow equations, if you remember the, the nonlinear. Uh, so now we use the linear approximation and you, you can use those to bound. You can get certain bounds uh, on, on the voltage perturbations. Of course, that's what to, do. to use the exact equations would of course be more would be more ideal. One could imagine dynamic extensions. Um, so the main assumption here, I think was this tau time period. So the, this assumption that there is a failure detection system that verifies the updates in time tau. You can imagine that still in reality that could happen, fail, failures can occur later that you didn't detect in time tau. So how do you somehow dynamically readjust, take that into account uh, using, for instance, some sort of receding horizon type of scheme. Of course, for that to work, it's critical that you can compute the schedules a little time. I think we already have that. So I think this is one possibility. And of course, it would be nice to have a heuristics that comes with optimality gaps. So I mentioned already that in the single bin packing problem there, the, the, this heuristics that I mentioned, they, 
you see this is the, op the optimality bound available for so the true optimum is T star, but these FFD and BFD, they, they, they give you a solution that is no worse than 11 over nine times T star plus one times so you're very, so they're very efficient. So it would be nice, of course, to, to have something similar uh, to verify that, that the heuristic is, is working. Uh, in general, on this lecture, um, I'd like to say that there are many large scale combinatorial optimization problem in this domain of power grid, smart power grids in particular. Uh, there's reconfiguration problem. I already show you that diagram of the, the Taiwanese system. There are possibilities to change tie switches to minimize losses. Unit commitment, uh, optimal power flow problem. How should you optimize production in, in power grid? Which devices should be used when? Fault diagnosis and isolation, for instance, how do you find misbehaving devices? Security and continuous analysis is a problem we've also been working on in, in different uh, projects, uh, also combinatorial often, to try to find the uh, interacting fault condition and so on, similar to what we did here. I gave you a scheduling problem here today, the updates. Uh, we have also, <clears throat> used quite similar techniques using mixed interlinear programs for demand response problem. So how to uh, schedule the use of different smart uh, home appliances. So how do we minimize the, uh, the energy consumption uh, or the, uh, minimize the, uh, the price, for instance, or the uh, maximize the use of green power subject to, to constraints of, of the individual home appliances. So that's in reference six, I will show you the references and so on. So there are many, uh, uh, many interesting uh, problems here. I think it's also would be interesting to think about more distributed solutions. There was a question about that. Here we have a centralized scheduler and a fault detection system. Is, is there a distributed solution to the problem? That would be interesting. I'll also encourage you to not be uh, just because the problem becomes combinatorial to just give it up. I mean, there are, there are efficient solvers like Robin and CPEX, and I, I think they actually work uh, rather good many times and so give them a try. Uh, and especially if you can add, use structure and add these valid constraints that can often make it interesting. Also showed you some basics, dist flow and lean dist flow modeling for radial grids. And that's something that you find useful. Um, and finally, this, uh, I think it's often uh, maybe underestimated, but this real time application maintenance and rollouts in critical infrastructure in general is, is, is actually in, in practice a major challenge. So critical infrastructure like power grids or distribution systems in general, or even if factories, if they're running 24 uh, seven, these systems and there are safety constraints, it's, uh, uh, it, it's actually, uh, it's, it's hard to update. How do I do updates of these systems uh, without threatening any, any, any safety concerns, uh, safety constraints in the grid? And often there are lots of old legacy components there as well that we need to, to take into account. So how to do this, I think it's not uh, very you know, well studied always. So even many times, I think these systems, even if there are known vulnerabilities, for instance, in software, they still uh, are not being updated because it's basically a big hassle. It costs a lot to, to shut the system down to, to update. So I think better, better ways to do this is an interesting problem, especially if you want to transition out to more modern infrastructure that should somehow coexist with the legacy legacy devices. Uh, here, here are some of the, the, the references. So references one, Baran and Vu, this is the dist flow equations. Uh, Stephen Lowe, I think he will talk more about his work on uh, optimal power flow in the afternoon. Here's a lecture that goes into some more details on the power flow modeling you can recommend. Uh, so this scheduling problem I was talking quite a lot about at the end here, the minimum time secure rollout. This is, was, uh, and, um, is from this paper four here.
um, paper five and six are some related work. And six is this scheduling problem I mentioned at the very end of home appliances, if you find that interesting. Uh, and by that, I'm, uh, I'm done. And I think I ran over a little bit, I think, Ognien, but hopefully not too bad. <laughs>